Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the privilege of being in your presence today. What a joy it is to know that you are in our midst through the presence of your Holy Spirit and your angels. And Father, as we open your holy book, we plead for your help. For human minds cannot begin to comprehend the great things from your word. And so, Father, come to be with us. Instruct us and give us the capacity to live in harmony with what we learn. And we thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. For we ask it in the precious and powerful name of your beloved Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's reflect for a few moments about the world as it is after 9-11. We live in a world of unparalleled turmoil. The world economy is crumbling before our very eyes. The United States taxpayers have incurred a debt of over two trillion dollars just in the last few months. As you know, the United States government has had to bail out some very large banks and some significant corporations. And they've put a huge sum of money into uh, getting the economy of the United States on track again. But it's not only the United States that is in trouble. We live in a time of global economic turmoil. As you know, many states in the United States are almost bankrupt, including the state of California. Millions of people in the United States have lost their homes due to foreclosure. Life savings and retirement plans have disappeared. Corporate greed runs rampant in Wall Street and in the large corporations. And this has caused unprecedented financial loss for millions of people. And then we have the natural disasters which seem to be greater and more prevalent every day. Disasters that are of epic proportions, like Hurricane Katrina, like the Asian tsunami, like the terrible tornadoes that we had just a few months ago in the Midwestern United States. Hundred year fires in Australia and in California and earthquakes in different places. And what could we say about wars and rumors of wars? Israel and the Palestinians, Iraq, Afghanistan, India, Pakistan, and many other countries of the world that are embroiled in war. And then we have the threat of global pandemics and epidemics, bird flu, mad cow's disease, new strains of tuberculosis, AIDS, and other diseases that could devastate the human race. And then there is the ever-present danger of global terror and the perilous task of trying to guard our homeland security. And what could we say about the potential for biological, chemical, and nuclear weapons? On the moral level, Everything seems to go downhill. The gay marriage debate rages. Pornography runs rampant. The use of pornography on the air is prevalent. Abortions are performed without any pangs of conscience. School shootings and workplace shootings appear to be the rule of the day. Child abuse and kidnappings, husbands killing their wives, and global warming. I don't know how you feel about global warming, but it's definitely happening. Something is happening in this world that, ha that is disturbing the delicate ecosystem of planet Earth. In the midst of all of this turmoil and all of these problems, we ask the question, is there no hope? Is the world moving towards Armageddon? Is the world as we know it moving to its end. Well, during this series, I have good news. We're going to study God's final message to planet Earth. 
And that message is found in Revelation chapter 14 and verses 6 through 12. Now I'm going to tell you that we're going to study 24 sessions together. And we are going to analyze every phrase of the three angels' messages. We are not going to leave any stone unturned when it comes to the study of these three messages that God sends to planet earth. And I believe that when we finish the 24 sessions, those of us who attend will understand the relationship between all of these different aspects that we find in the three angels' messages and the urgent need that we have of preparing for the coming of Jesus Christ which I believe is to be even at the door, very, very imminent. I'd like to begin by reading the three angels' messages as we find in Revelation 14 and verses 6 through 12. And of course the title of our study today is 10 Great Facts About the Three Angels' Messages. So turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 14 and verses 6 through 12. Let's read the first angel's message. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. For the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. That's the first message. Now we go to the second. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And then we find a third angel's message beginning in verse 9. Then a third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, during this series, we are going to try to answer a series of questions. And so as we begin our study today, I would like to formulate those questions which we are going to answer in the course of the next 24 sessions that we have here together. Question number one. What is the everlasting gospel? It's mentioned in the first angel's message. What is the everlasting gospel that needs to be preached to the whole world? Second, what do three angels represent? Are we to expect three angels flying in the midst of heaven, zipping from one side of the heaven to the other? What do angels represent? What do angels symbolize? And then we must ask the question, why are they described as flying in the midst of heaven? Why are these angels flying? Why do these messages go to all of the world, as we've just read? What does it mean to fear God? What does it mean to give glory to God? What does the first angel's message mean when it says that we are in the hour of God's judgment? What does it mean to worship the Creator? What is Babylon? What is Babylon's wine of wrath? Because Babylon has wine. What does the wine represent? What does prophecy mean when it says that Babylon fornicates with the kings of the earth? Who is the beast? Who 
Or what is the image to the beast? What is the mark of the beast? What is the number of the beast's name? What is the wine of God's wrath? Why is God's wine poured without mixture? Will the worshipers of the beast be incinerated in fire that will never go out? After all, the Bible says, forever and ever. What is the patience of the saints? What are the commandments of God? What is meant by the faith of Jesus? And finally, who are the 144,000 and when will they live? And you say, why are you including the 144,000? Simply because in Revelation chapter 14 verses 1 through 5 you have the 144,000 before the three angels' messages are proclaimed which means that the 144,000 are somehow related to the three angels' messages. So we have our work cut out for us. We have a lot to study. We have to know who the beast is. How can you not worship the beast if you don't know who he is? You see, if we don't know who the beast is, we'll end up worshiping him. If we don't know what the image is, we'll end up worshiping the image. If we don't know what the mark of the beast is, we might just end up receiving the mark of the beast. So it's very important for us to understand these things. Now we want to take a look at ten facts concerning the three angels' messages. This is an introductory subject today. We're going to take a look at several introductory matters dealing with the three angels' messages. Fact number one. When the Bible says that three angels are proclaiming their messages to the world, we are not to understand that literal angels will zip across the sky at the speed of lightning, shouting with a loud voice the messages that we find in Revelation chapter 14. The fact is that in the Bible, angels are depicted as helping human beings proclaim the message. In other words, the angels represent heavenly messengers that use human beings to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ. Take, for example, Revelation chapter 1 and verses 1 to 3, where we find a very interesting process. Revelation chapter 1 and verses 1 through 3. This is the introduction to the book of Revelation. And it says there, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. Now notice the sequence. God gave Jesus a certain revelation. And he gave it to him to show whom? His servants, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Do you see a chain of command here? Very clearly there's a chain of command. God the Father gives the message to Jesus. Jesus gives the message to his angel. The angel then whispers in John's ear and says, this is the message that I want you to write down. And so now the angel gives the message to John. And John gives the message to the churches, and the churches are supposed to give the message to the world. In other words, the angels are depicted as three messages that the angels help human beings to proclaim to the world. By the way, the word angel in Greek, angelos, actually means messenger. And did you know that in the New Testament, certain human beings are called angels? You say, now how's that? Well, let me just mention some. We're not going to read the text, but if you want, you can write them down. Epaphroditus. You say, well, that's a weird name. Is he in the Bible? Yes. He's in Philippians 2, verse 25. The Apostle Paul mentions him. But he's called an angel. He's called a messenger. John the Baptist, in Matthew 11, verse 10, is called a messenger or an angel. You remember that there were certain messengers that John sent to speak with Jesus. The word messengers there is the word angeloi. In other words, they are angels. The spies that went to Jericho, according to James 2 and verse 25, were angels or messengers. Even the Apostle Paul in Galatians 4 verse 14 is called an angel or a messenger. And of course, we know about Stephen, that first martyr of the Christian church. 
In Acts 6 verse, verse 15, it says that his face was like the face of an angel. Now we all know that God has not committed the preaching of the gospel to angels, has he? Jesus did not say to the angels, go proclaim the gospel to the world. The work of proclaiming the everlasting gospel to the world has been committed to the servants of Jesus Christ, to human beings. But they are aided in their work by the angelic host. In fact, notice Matthew 28 and verses 19 and 20, about actually verses 18, 19 and 20, where it tells us to whom it has been committed to preach the everlasting gospel. It says there in verse 18, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, he's speaking to his disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Amen. Notice that the great commission of preaching the gospel was committed to the disciples. It's not committed to angels. You see, the angels never needed to be redeemed. They don't know what it means to be redeemed. Only those who have been redeemed can proclaim the message of redemption with power because they know the experience of the gospel. Also in Acts chapter 1 and verse uh, 8 we find the command of Jesus to his disciples to proclaim the gospel. Once again the gospel has not been committed to angels to proclaim by streaking across the sky and shouting with a loud voice God's message. It's committed to human beings but angels help human beings. Notice Acts chapter 1 verse 8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Incidentally, I would like to share with you two experiences where an angel actually helped one of the followers of Jesus to proclaim the message. Do you remember the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch? Let me ask you, who was it that actually took Philip so that he could go speak and meet with the Ethiopian eunuch? If you read Acts chapter 8 and verse 26, it says that the angel directed Philip to go and meet with the Ethiopian eunuch. And then, of course, Philip shared the message of God with the eunuch. And then we also have the example of the Apostle Peter. You remember that Peter preached the gospel to Cornelius, but it was an angel that came to Cornelius and actually put him in touch or put him in contact with Simon Peter. In other words, the angels give the message to human beings and then human beings proclaim the gospel to the world. So these three angels represent messages that God sends by the angelic host to us, for us to proclaim to the world. That's fact number one. The three angels represent human beings preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world, particularly God's end time people. Now let's go to fact number two. We're told as we read in Revelation 14 that the angels fly in the midst of heaven. This must mean that the messages of the three angels are of heavenly origin. You know, whenever God speaks in the book of Revelation, God's message always comes from above. It always comes from heaven. On the other hand, the powers of Satan come from the sea, from the abyss, and from the earth. In other words, the fact that these three messages are depicted as three angels flying in the midst of heaven, coming from heaven to earth, means that these messages are directly sent by God. They are heavenly messages. Incidentally, in the Bible, to speak of beneath is the realm of Satan. To speak of above is the realm of Jesus Christ. It's the realm of God. So whenever an angel comes from heaven, it means a message from God. James chapter 3, I want you to notice, James chapter 3 tells us this 
Speaking about the wisdom that doesn't come from above, it says this wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. So where does the power of Satan come from? It comes not from above, but from where? From beneath. Revelation chapter 18 verse 1, which we're going to study in this series later on, speaks of a powerful angel that comes down from heaven. And he cries with a mighty voice that Babylon has fallen. And then he calls God's people to come out of Babylon. This message comes with great power from heaven. So fact number two is that the fact that these angels are depicted as flying in the midst of heaven means that these messages are of heavenly origin. They come directly from the throne of God. Fact number three. We're told twice in the three angels' messages that these messages are proclaimed with a loud voice. It's interesting, the Greek word that is used for loud voice is the word megaphone. What word do we get from megaphone? The word megaphone, right? Have you ever heard of megaphone? You know, you use them on campouts. I know at cap, uh, camperies, Pathfinder camperies, you have a megaphone to call all of the pathfinders together. Let me ask you, when you use the megaphone, can you hear the message? You certainly can. And sometimes it's so loud that it actually squeals, and then everybody can hear it. And so that's the word that is used. These messages are of heavenly origin. Human beings are supposed to preach them, and they come with great power because they're proclaimed with a loud voice. In other words, there is no word parsing or political correctness in these messages. This is not some ambivalent doublespeak. There's no mute on the trumpet. It is to be shouted from the rooftops, no matter what the consequences are. The messages are to be proclaimed with utmost power. Fact number four, the angels fly. Now what does that represent, the angels flying? It represents the speed with which this message is supposed to go to the world. Now let me ask you, how fast do angels fly? Well, let's go to Ezekiel 1. Ezekiel chapter 1 and verses 13 and 14. Let me ask you, are these messages supposed to go with utmost speed to all of the world? Absolutely. This, these messages of heavenly origin are to go to all of the world with great power and with the utmost velocity. Notice what it says in Ezekiel 1 verses 13 and 14. It's speaking about the four living creatures which represents the angelic host. And notice what it says. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went lightning. And the living creatures ran back and forth in appearance like a flash of lightning. How fast do angels travel? Like with the speed of lightning. How fast does this message need to go to the world? It needs to go to the world with the speed of lightning. But unfortunately it's going to the world with the speed of a snail. Or the speed of a tortoise. It's not because the angelic host isn't waiting anxiously for this message to be proclaimed to the world. It's simply because we as human beings have not lent ourselves to be used by the power of God to proclaim these heavenly messages of God to the world so that the end can come. You know, I have an example of the speed of the travel of angels. You remember that in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel was praying because he wanted some wisdom about uh, understanding a uh, prophecy that said, Unto 2300 days in the sanctuary shall be cleansed, which was in the previous chapter, Daniel 8 verse 14. And Daniel was praying because he wanted to understand that time prophecy. And if you read there in Daniel chapter 9, it says that Gabriel, when Daniel began his prayer, he left the heavenly throne, and before Daniel finished his prayer, Gabriel was next to his side. So how fast do angels travel? They travel very, very swiftly. And God wants these messages to go with utmost swiftness. Fact number five. The messages are worldwide in scope. 
In other words, the messages are, are of heavenly origin, they're to be proclaimed by human beings with the utmost velocity, with great power, and they are to be proclaimed in all of the world. Now listen to what I'm going to tell you. Most Christians today, most conservative Christians that is, uh, evangelicals, Pentecostals, etc., believe that the three angels' messages are actually messages that will be proclaimed during the tribulation after the church has been raptured to heaven. In fact, they believe that everything from Revelation 4 all the way through Revelation chapter 19 applies to the Jews in the Middle East after the church has been raptured to heaven. But my question regarding that is this. If this message or these messages, because it's one message composed of three parts, if these messages are to be proclaimed only to the Jews, why do we find that it says that these messages are supposed to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people? Obviously these messages are, are not only for the Jews in the Middle East. These messages are to be proclaimed on a worldwide scale, which means that in order to proclaim them, you have to have a worldwide people to announce them. Now, I'm just throwing that out. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on. A worldwide message being proclaimed necessitates a worldwide people that understands these messages and is willing to go out and preach these messages. These messages are to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. They are global in extent. Notice Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. You notice that the first angel's message speaks about preaching the everlasting gospel. And then when you get to the end of the three angels' messages, you have the harvest. In other words, Jesus is seated on a cloud. He has a sickle on his hand. The end has come. The earth has been harvested. In other words, the preaching of the gospel has come to an end. Now I want you to notice what Jesus said in harmony with this. Matthew 24 and verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached where? In all the world. As a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. And in Mark chapter 16, the last few verses, it says, And he said to them, Jesus says to the disciples, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go into all the world and preach what? And preach the gospel to whom? To the Jews? No. Preach the gospel to all the world. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So what is the purpose of the three angels' messages? The purpose of the three angels' messages is to proclaim the gospel to gather as many people as possible into God's camp. In other words, to gather as many people as possible onto God's side. That's the purpose of the three angels' messages. They go to every nation because Jesus, through the gospel, wants to conquer the world for himself. But do you know something very interesting that we're going to study later on in Revelation? And that is that the devil also has three counterfeit angels' messages. You say, now how is that? Go with me to Revelation chapter 16. We're just going to briefly introduce this. Revelation chapter 16. And I want to read verse 13 and verse 14. 16 verse 13 and verse 14. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. Let me ask you, what are unclean spirits? What were the unclean spirits that Jesus cast out when he was on this earth? Demons. And what are demons? Fallen angels. Thank you very much. So notice it says here in Revelation 16 and verse 13, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of where? The mouth. What do you use your mouth for? To speak, right? And this is not talking about eating because we eat through our mouth too. But it says here that, that the three unclean spirits come out of the mouth. In other words, it means that these three unclean spirits are proclaiming a what? A message. That's right. Coming out of the mouth of the dragon, we're going to study this, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. What is the purpose of this trilogy, of these three counterfeit angels, of these three evil spirits? Why are they speaking out of their mouths? They have a purpose, and it's to gather the world on the devil's side. Notice verse 14. 
For they are spirits of demons, performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So how many groups of three messages do we have? We have two groups of three messages. We have God's three messages, which are proclaimed from the mouth with power, the everlasting gospel. The purpose is to gather the whole world on God's side. But the devil also has three counterfeit angels that are called demons, and out of their mouths, out of the mouths of the dragon and the beast and the false prophet, these three angels proclaim their messages, and their messages also have the intention of gathering the whole world on whose side? On the devil's side. By the way, do you know the reason why God wants these three angels' messages to go to the whole world? Simply because the Bible says that Babylon, who is called the harlot in Revelation chapter 17, she controls all of the peoples in the world. You say, how's that? Go with me to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 1. It says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Where does the harlot sit? On many waters. What does that mean that she sits? It means that she rules. She controls, right? She sits on many waters. Let me ask you, what are those many waters that she sits on? Go with me to verse 15. Verse 15. It says, Then he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are people's multitudes, nations, and tongues. Are those the same groups that the three angels' messages go to? Yes. Do the three angels' messages go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people? Absolutely. Who does the harlot sit on? Every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So why does God send these three messages? He sends these three messages to say to the people upon whom the harlot sits, get out of there before the plagues are poured out and before you are destroyed. So the question is, which three messages are we going to listen to? Are we going to listen to God's three messages that are from heavenly origin? They're the preaching of the everlasting gospel with absolute power and velocity to all of the world to gather people on God's side. Or are we going to accept the three messages of these evil spirits who are fallen angels who have the intention of gathering us not on God's side, but on Satan's side. You see, the book of Revelation tells us that there's only going to be two sides at the end of time. Those who have the seal of God and those who have the mark of the beast. So fact number five is that these messages are worldwide to counteract the worldwide message of these three counterfeit angels' messages that come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Now let's go to fact number six. These messages are supposed to be proclaimed in their proper order. You say, what do you mean by their proper order? You know, if you try to proclaim the third angel's message without proclaiming the first and the second before, people will not be able to make sense out of it. In other words, the messages must be proclaimed in their order. The first message we need to proclaim and understand first. Then we'll be ready to understand the second. And after we understand the second, we will be ready to understand the third. Now you say, how do we know that they are sequential and that we need to study them in their order? Notice Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6. 14 verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. Okay, so you have an angel that flies in the midst of heaven. Now notice verse 8, And another angel, what's the next word? Another angel what? Followed. Is there an order here? Most certainly. And then notice verse 9, Then a third angel followed them. Is there an order to the three angels' messages? Most certainly. And if we get the order wrong, people will never listen. You say, what do you mean? Let me explain. The reason why Babylon falls in the second angel's message is because Babylon rejected the first angel's message. Are you with me? When you go to Revelation chapter 18, God says, Babylon has fallen, come out over my people. So people say, why should I come out? You say, yeah, come out over my people. Why should I come out? Do you know the reason why? 
because Babylon has rejected the first angel's message. So before people are ready to come out of Babylon and join God's forces, they need to understand the reason why. And the first angel's message gives you the reason why. The first angel, you see, has three imperatives and has three commands. The first angel's message says, says fear God. By the way, that's not uh, just counsel. That's not just, uh, I hope you'll do it. It is an imperative in the Greek language. It says, fear God. Give glory to Him. Because the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who created the heavens, the earth, and the fountains of waters. The reason why Babylon falls is because she's not fearing God. So we need to understand what it means to fear God. The re reason why Babylon has fallen is because she's not giving glory to God. She's giving glory to herself. The reason why Babylon has fallen is because she refuses to believe that the hour of God's judgment has come. The reason why Babylon has fallen is because Babylon does not worship the creator of the heavens, the earth, the seas, and everything that is in them. In other words, for people to be willing to come out of Babylon, the second angel's message, in order for people to understand that Babylon has fallen, they need to understand why Babylon has fallen. Babylon has fallen because she refused the first angel's message. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And let me share this with you. If we do not proclaim the first angel's message, people will feel no incentive to come under, out of Babylon in the second angel's message. And they will feel no urgency to receive the final warning in the third angel's message. Because the third angel's message says, Woe if you worship the beast, or if you worship his image, or if you receive his number, or if you receive his mark, because you will re receive the wrath of God poured out without mixture. Let me ask you, are people going to want to listen to that warning and not worship the beast, or his image, or receive the mark, or receive the number of his name, if they don't understand the first angel's message? Absolutely not. You see, we have a sequence. The first angel's message tells us the positive message of God. The second message says, get out of Babylon because Babylon has rejected the first angel's message. And then the third angel's message says, if you don't get out, you'll end up worshiping the beast in his image. You'll end up receiving the mark and you'll receive the plagues. So basically, in the first angel's message, you have a command of God. In the second message you have a call to come out from where that command is not being obeyed. And in the third message God says, if you don't come out, the plagues and the wrath of God will fall upon you. So these three messages must be proclaimed in their proper order. Let's go to fact number seven. These messages are God's final appeal and message to the world. Before the close of human probation, and the second coming of Jesus. These are God's last message. There will be no further message besides these three. And you say, well, Pastor Bohr, how do you know that? For the simple reason that as soon as the third message is finished, you have message number one, number two, and number three. As soon as number three is proclaimed, notice what we find in chapter 14 and verse 14. Revelation 14 and verse 14. Then, I looked... And behold, a white cloud. And on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. What event is being described in that verse? The coming of Christ. When does the coming of Christ take place in the sequence of Revelation 14? It comes immediately after the third angel's message is proclaimed. Which means that these three messages are God's final message to the world, and then the end will come. Are you understanding my point? So you have the three messages, and then Jesus is seen sitting on a cloud with a sickle in his hand, and he's going to come to harvest the earth. He's going to come to gather his people, and he's going to come to destroy the wicked. You can continue reading it there in Revelation 14. So let me ask you, how urgent is it for us to understand these three angels' messages in these last days? It's a matter of life and death, because it's the last message. There will be no other message that God will give 
to the world after this one. Now let's go to fact number eight. The proclamation of these three messages will be accompanied by the power of the latter rain. Do you understand what I mean by the latter rain? You know, in, Bibli in biblical um, areas, you have the early rain and you have the latter rain. The early rain is that rain that falls in the spring that causes the seed to germinate and to begin its growth. And then the rain continues falling throughout the season and then eventually you have the latter rain and the purpose of the latter rain is to ripen that which has been growing through the influence of the early rain. Now let me ask you, when was the early rain poured out according to scripture? It was poured out when God poured out the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Isn't that correct? The Holy Spirit was poured out with power. Let me ask you, did the, did the disciples go out and preach the gospel with power? Were thousands upon thousands gathered on God's side? Did multitudes come from the side of the devil to the side of God? Absolutely. But the Bible teaches that at the end of time, God is going to have a people that will proclaim the three angels' messages under the power of the latter rain with the purpose of maturing the human race and preparing the human race for the harvest. For the harvest on God's side, which is the righteous, and for the harvest of the wicked, which are called the grapes in Revelation 14, on the devil's side. You say, how do we know that these messages are accompanied by the latter rain? Well, let's go back to Revelation chapter 14. And you're going to see that God is going to pour out the Holy Spirit with great power upon the, upon the world. And do you know what's going to happen? When He pours out His Holy Spirit, God's people will proclaim the message just like the disciples did. And thousands upon thousands will come over to the Lord's side in preparation for the second coming of Jesus. And the whole world will be polarized into two groups as a result of the power and the message that goes along with the power. You say, how do we know that? Well, notice Revelation chapter 14 and let's read verse 14. Immediately after the third angel's message it says, Then I looked and behold a white cloud and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, now notice this, thrust in your sickle and reap for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Let me ask you, in biblical times, what was it that ripened the harvest? What ripened the harvest was the latter rain. The early rain began the germination process. You know, like in Fresno, you have the rain in the spring, right? And that germinates the seed and it leads it to grow, and you have the harvest later on. Well, the same thing you have in biblical times. By the way, the climate in Fresno is very similar to the climate in Israel. It, we're in the subtropical zone, just like they are. That's why a lot of our products are the same products that you have in Israel. Because the, the weather patterns are very, very similar. And so you have the early rain, and you have the latter rain. The purpose of the latter rain is with the three angels' messages, the power of the Holy Spirit is poured out upon His people, and as a result, the whole earth is ripened either as the harvest of the earth, which is the righteous, or the grapes of the earth, which is the wicked. What this means is that the three angels' messages are going to ripen the world in two different ways. The people who reject these three angels' messages will be the grapes. They'll be fully ripened against these messages. Whereas on the other side you have those who receive these messages with the power of the Holy Spirit, and they will be also ripened but they will be ripened on God's side. And when all of the world has made its decision to be on one side or the other because the messages have been proclaimed with the power of the Holy Spirit, then probation will close and then Jesus will come. Fact number nine, and this is a very important fact. The three angels' messages are linked with the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. The three angels' messages are linked with what? With the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. You say, now what's this issue of the heavenly sanctuary? Let me just say that God has a sanctuary in heaven which is the great original. The one that He told Moses to build in the wilderness was only a copy of, it was actually a copy of a, of a um, how would you say, a small scale model of the real sanctuary that we find in heaven. 
And in the sanctuary you had three apartments. You had the court where the sacrifices were offered. You had the holy place where the priest entered to intercede for the sins of Israel. And you had the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was found and inside the Ark of the Covenant was God's holy law. Now you say, Pastor, how do you know that the three angels' messages need to be connected or linked with the most holy place of the sanctuary? Let me give you some indications why. Day after tomorrow, in our third lecture in this series, we're going to study what it means to fear God. In Scripture, very, very frequently, when you find that expression, fear God, it is linked with keeping the commandments of God. Just to give you one example, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13, it says, Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into what? Judgment. Notice how similar to Revelation 14 where it says, Fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. Ecclesiastes says, Fear God and keep His commandments, for God will bring every work into what? Into judgment. Fearing God is coupled with keeping God's commandments. Now let me ask you, in which apartment of the sanctuary were the Ten Commandments contained? They were contained in the most holy place. Furthermore, the first angel's message calls people to worship the Creator. Let me ask you, what sign did God give of worship to the Creator? You go back to Genesis chapter 2, it says that the, at the end of creation week, God rested on which day? God rested on the seventh day. And then He commanded Adam and Eve to rest every seventh day in commemoration of the work of creation. Now let me ask you, where is the Sabbath found in the sanctuary? It is found in the tables of the law, and the tables of the law were where? they were in the most holy place of the sanctuary. By the way, the three angels' messages end by speaking about a people who keep the commandments of God. So the commandments are involved, but the commandments are in the most holy place. The first angel's message says, worship the Creator. The sign of the Creator is the Sabbath. The Sabbath was in the law, and the law is in the most holy place of the sanctuary. But there's more. The first angel's message also tells us that the hour of God's judgment has come. Let me ask you, in which apartment of the sanctuary in the Old Testament do you have an illustration of the judgment? Once a year, on the great Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the great judgment day of Israel, those who were faithful to God and those who were unfaithful to God were separated one from another in the judgment when the law of God came into view. And in what apartment did the Day of Atonement take place primarily? It took place in the most holy place. That's where the, the blood was sprinkled, was on the mercy seat in the most holy place to satisfy the demands of the law. So when the first angel's message says, the hour of his judgment has come, immediately we say, if this is the judgment, it must involve the law, because we will judge, be judged by the perfect law of liberty, and the law was in which apartment? In the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. But there's more. Do you know that this passage that we're studying actually begins in Revelation 11 and verse 19? Do you know what Revelation 11 verse 19 says? Where this whole passage of the three angels messages begins? It begins by saying that John saw heaven opened and the temple of God in heaven was opened. And what was seen in his temple? The ark of his covenant. Let me ask you, where was the ark of the covenant in the sanctuary? The ark of his covenant was in the most holy place. So this whole passage that has the three angels messages in the heart of the book of Revelation begins with the opening of the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant is. And then of course you have the dragon introduced in chapter 12, you have the beast introduced in Revelation 13, the first ten verses, and then you have the second beast, the image to the beast, introduced into the latter half of Revelation 13, and then in chapter 14 
you have the hour of his judgment. And interestingly enough, when you get to Revelation chapter 15, the first part of the chapter says that the temple of God in heaven is now closed. And no one can enter the temple until the seven last plagues have been poured out because probation has closed. Isn't that interesting that you have this passage, Revelation 11, 19, the most holy place is opened, the ark of his covenant is seen, and then you have an introduction to the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, which we're going to study in connection with the three angels' messages. And then God warns against the beast and his image and his mark in the three angels' messages. And after that warning, we find that the temple in heaven closes, the most holy place closes. No one is able to enter the temple anymore because probation has closed. Fact number 10. The acceptance or rejection of these messages is not a trivial matter. In fact, it is a matter of life or death. It's not optional. You can't say, oh, you know, if you accept them, fine. If you don't accept them, that's fine. You know, ultimately everybody's going to the same place. My Bible tells me that those who listen to these three angels' messages will receive the seal of God. And those who reject these messages will receive the mark of the beast. And one group will be saved in God's kingdom. The other group will receive the wrath of God. So let me ask you, are these messages a matter of life and death? They most certainly are. Now, when I was in school, I used to like bonuses. Say, teacher, could you please give us a bonus question? So I'm going to give you two bonus facts to end our study today. Praise the Lord that there will be a people, because the question is, is God going to have a people in the world who will accept these messages and eventually be saved? There's good news. God will have a people who will listen to these messages, they will accept them, they will proclaim them to the world, and they will be faithful till the end, and they will be saved. Notice Revelation chapter 15. Revelation chapter 15 and verses 2 through 4. Revelation 15 verses 2 through 4. Notice here you have a group that's victorious over what the three angels' message mentions, the beast, his image, his number, his mark. There's a group that's going to be victorious because they receive the three angels' messages. It says in verse 2, And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have the victory, ha, I love that, those who have the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. Is there going to be a group that's going to reject the beast and his image and his mark and his number? You better believe it. And they're going to be victorious. Verse 3, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of saints. So there will be a group that will listen to these messages and that will ultimately be saved in Christ's kingdom. They will stand on the sea of glass and they will sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. They will not worship the beast. Let me ask you something. Do you think it's important to know who the beast is? How are you going to not worship the beast if you don't know who he is? Is it important to know what the mark of the beast is? Of course, if you don't know what the mark of the beast is, how can you be sure that you won't receive it? Is it important to know what the image to the beast is? Of course, if you don't know what the image is, you might end up worshiping it. Some people say, oh no, when the temple is rebuilt over the Middle East, and the Antichrist, this nasty individual, sits in the temple, and he raises up this great big statue, I'll say, oh, that's the image to the beast. I'm not worshiping that. You think the devil is dumb? You think it's going to be that obvious? You think that it's talking about a literal image and a literal individual that's going to sit in a rebuilt Jerusalem temple? Not according to what we're going to study from the three angels' messages in Scripture. Bonus fact number, th number, 12, uh, number two, and this would be fact number 12. Listen to this. The central issue which will divide the world into two camps will be the issue of worship and obedience. You say, how do we know that? 
Notice Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, once again, as we draw this to a close. 14, 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Why do you suppose the first angel's message calls the world to worship the Creator? Let's go to the third angel's message, which is the opposite. It says in verse 9, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Let me ask you, how many systems are there that will demand worship at the end of time? Two. The Creator and the beast. So let me ask you, in some sense, will the beast be a counterfeit creator? Let me ask you, why do we worship God? Because He's our Creator and we are what? Creatures. What sign has He given us that He is the Creator and we are creatures? The Sabbath. So when we worship on the Sabbath, we're recognizing and worshiping whom? The Creator. Is it just possible that the beast claims to have creative power? And he also has a sign, a sign of his authority, that when we keep his sign, we are recognizing him, and we are worshiping him. Don't you think that people are just going to kneel down and start worshiping an individual? No. Worship is a far deeper and greater issue. It involves a creator and a counterfeit creator. It involves one sign versus another sign. So I trust that we'll continue coming because we have great things that we're going to study in this seminar.